Uh, let's, our scripture reading today is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. And I'm going to ask that if you are able, if you would stand for the reading of scripture. Thank you. We're going to start in verse 13. Jesus is teaching here and he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad fruit bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have any of you ever gone whitewater rafting before? Raise your hands. Okay, a lot of people. Look at that. Some brave souls here, of course. You know, I grew up uh, in South Carolina. We were closer to North Carolina. And when I was working in churches, we used to go up to the western area of North Carolina, sort of west of Asheville. We would go on youth retreats up there, and we would take our students down the Natahala River on whitewater rafting adventures. And if you've been down that, you know that it's not an easy river, but it's not really that challenging. It's pretty, it's pretty tame until the very end where there is a rapid that goes over a waterfall, about a five-foot drop that goes down that. So when we went for the first time to the Coe, it was a lot more fun and a lot more dangerous uh, when I was here in Alabama. It was a lot more fun. Now, my wife, Julie, had never gone whitewater rafting before. So at one of our, one of our uh, anniversaries, we went out of town and we were up in that area and we decided to go whitewater rafting together. It was her first time. And uh, she was so lucky at the very end of our trip down the river, she got to what they called riding the bull. Do you see on this picture, the very first person is sort of sitting on the front of the raft. That's what they call riding the bull. When you go down the river, it's very difficult to fall forward in it unless you hit a rock real hard. For the most part, everybody just falls backward into the boat, but you held on. You were great. Um, So that was her first experience, but I don't want to talk about riding the bull because I've never gotten to do it. She did. What I want to talk about was the experience before we got to the front of the boat. You see, we were in the very back of the boat. There's usually about seven people in a whitewater rafting trip down the river. And the seventh person is the guide in the very back who's sort of serving as the rudder and leading us down the river. So Julie and I were in the back and there were two other couples that were on the raft with us. The wives were in the very middle and the husbands were in the front. 
And we could tell, Julie and I, that our guide was getting very frustrated with the husbands in the very front because she would call out, paddle left, and they wouldn't do anything. (laughs) She would call out, paddle right, nothing. Paddle hard, nothing. And they were just talking and laughing the whole time. What we found out later is that both of them had hearing aids and they were worried about them getting wet, so they took them out uh, before they got into the boat. So that's why they weren't doing anything. But the wives would sometimes have to yell the instructions again. So the the guide would yell, and then the wives would yell, and they would actually do something. And then sometimes Julie and I would have to do that. All of that was going on. We were having to sort of overcompensate for them because they were just chatting away and not paddling. And we were really, really digging into the water. And I got frustrated once because I saw one of the men up front who just basically, there's a picture of of a canoe paddle doing this, but just barely touching the water like that. Like they were kind of doing this and we were going down the river and it was a part of the river where the current wasn't really carrying you. And so we were working hard and I just started getting frustrated and my witness as a Christian had to take over before I said something. But anyway, we're going down the river and we're about to get to the part that's a little bit more dangerous, the part that's a little bit more dicey. And the guide gets us to go over to a calmer part of the river and puts Julie and I in the front and moves the men to the back. And it was because the guide knew that we would not be able to go down this river safely if we just followed the current, which is essentially what we were doing because not everybody was working as a team to get down the river. You see, the guides are often people that have been down the river over and over and over again, and they're, they're used to working with people that get into their boat that don't always know each other, and they're at varying different skill sets and abilities, right? So they're used to being able to sort of manage different people and different abilities down the river. But at this point, she realized she didn't have the boat stacked in the right order to safely navigate because we're awesome. Um, uh, No. But you see, what happens is, is that the water goes, the current goes towards the place of least resistance. Meaning that unless you can learn to steer a boat in the right direction, you will follow that current down the river, will you not? And there are some rapids that are fun and exhilarating and are worth going over. And there are others that are just too dangerous. And it's the guide's knowledge and skill, knowing what's ahead to know how to best put that boat in the right position. Because if it just follows, if it just follows that path of least resistance, it can be dangerous. If you can paddle against the flow of the current, then maybe you'll end up in the right place, the safe place, still fun and exciting, but not dangerous. You know, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, as he's ending this sermon, that there are two paths that each and every one of us can take. There are two paths, and both these paths lead to a gate. The challenging path that takes a little bit more energy and exertion, you have to strive to actually get down this road, leads to a narrow gate. But the easy path, the the one that almost anyone can get down, leads to a wide gate, and it's pretty easy to get through that gate. But he says that if you go in the wide direction, the easy direction, it leads to destruction. But if you go down the road that's challenging, that takes you know, effort to get down it, then you will find life, an eternal life. It's worth going down that road, even though it's more difficult. Now, Jesus is using these two options, of course, to make it clear to us what it takes to be a disciple when the going gets tough. At the same time, he is coming from a rich tradition of Jewish teachers before him, None of them were the son of the living God, but they were before him and they used these types of dualistic options to help us figure out what's right and what's wrong. This is something that is very clear in Proverbs. 
Maybe if you've done a study of the book of Proverbs, or maybe you've just flicked through there to see some of the wisdom knowledge, wisdom uh, teaching that's there. Sometimes you will see that the wise person does this, but the foolish person does this. And it's pretty clear what the Bible wants us to do, right? Does the Bible want us to be foolish? No. The Bible is saying you have the option to be foolish. God is going to let you do that. But God wants you to be wise and do the right thing. Or it might say the strong do this, but the weak do this, right? There are two options. The strong are not just strong in terms of mere physical strength, but they have strong character. They have a strong idea of who they are and what is good and right, whereas the weak are able to bend too easily and go along with the flow. Psalms, the book of Psalms, also has this sort of of dualistic approach to options in life. If you look at the very first Psalm, it's all about two options— And here we have the final verse, Psalm 1, verse 6. It says, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This sounds a lot like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? The way of the righteous, Psalm 1 says, is watched over by God. They have fruit that they bear good fruit if they are in the way of the righteous. Now, fruit is the the result of your living, right? If you're a good, kind person, the fruit of your life are people that like you and that love you and that know that you're a person that will be helpful to them. The fruit of your life, if it's bad, is that people avoid you. People don't want to be near around you. People know that you are not someone that they can count on when the going gets tough. Do you see the... The action and fruit, the result of our lives is the fruit we bear. And what Psalm 1 says is that if we follow the way of the righteous, we will bear good fruit and and God will be with us and we will find life. The opposite of all of that is true with the way of the wicked. Notice that Psalm 1 says that it's about our choosing to be on the path And then our actions of staying on that path. Both go together. I think this is really important for us as we look at Jesus talking about these two options. The the challenging road, the difficult road goes to that narrow gate. And it is a challenging but rewarding journey. Jesus is really clear about this. If, If it was only about our belief or our intentions then simply choosing to go through the narrow gate would be the clear option, right? If I believe in Jesus, then I will go through this narrow gate. It might take me a while. There's a line, but I'll still get through it. But that's not what Jesus says. He doesn't just say it's whether you believe or not believe. He says that the road to get to that gate is difficult. And people don't always make it to the end of that road because they don't stick with the path. They don't stay on the road. They give up before they even get there. It's a lot easier to go on the easy path, right? How many of us have been in the airport and we are walking down those long areas and there's that that horizontal escalator, a people mover, right? You can walk on your own, but how many of us like to go on that people mover and just relax and we are carried along? Now, some of us are late to our plane, so what do we do? We get on that people mover and we run down that and we get frustrated when people are in our way. <laughs> now, think about this. Think about this. The easy road is kind of like that, that we can just get on it and it will go down that path. It's easy, it doesn't require a lot of us. It's like that river. We can get in the boat and we can go down that river and it'll be rough at some points, but it's going to be easy to get down it because we're just going to flow along with the current. The easy road is often the one that leads to destruction. It doesn't take a lot from us. It doesn't require a lot from us. We can just exist and be on that road. And Jesus says this leads to destruction How many of us have experienced this? 
when we were not living with intention, when we were not focusing on being a good person or following in the way of Jesus, how many of us actually made mistakes? How many of us made mistakes that cost us something? How many of us actually regret doing that? And yet, if we're not careful, if we're not living with intention, we find ourselves where? Right back on that road, even though we know it leads to destruction. And our parents have reminded us about this. They remind us that sometimes it's the people that we're with that are dangerous to us. It's the people that we surround ourselves with that are going to influence us us the wrong way. They say to us, you know, be careful who you hang out with. Be careful with your circle of friends because they might have a bad influence on you. Or you might hear it from a parent. Maybe you've said this to a child of yours. If everybody in your friend group jumps off of a building or a a mountain, would you do it as well, right? I see a couple of children going like this, right? You've heard it. You've heard it, right? But the truth is, is that when we're not living with intention in our lives, we will go with the flow. We will follow those around us. How many people have been caught up in a moment and did things that they regret because everybody else was doing it? They were surrounded with people that were doing the wrong thing and they lived to regret it. All you have to do is think about what happens when a team wins the World Series or the Super Bowl. They go out in the streets and they're celebrating on the streets and all of a sudden one person gets the idea, hey, let's flip this car over. And then everybody does it, right? And the police have to show up. Why do you need to flip over a car when your sports team won, right? That doesn't make any sense at all. And yet people get caught up in the moment. It's because they're going with the flow. They're heading in a direction that's easy. It doesn't cost them saying, no, I don't want to do this. Jesus is teaching us a very important lesson of life that if we're not careful, if we're not living with intention, we will go on this easy road and it leads to a wide gate. It's not going to require anything of us, but it can lead to our destruction. It's living with intention. It's, it's knowing who we are and whose we are and why we are here and what our life means and what it can mean if we reflect Jesus that matters. That's what Jesus calls the difficult road to the narrow gate. Now that word narrow, it does not just mean that it's constricted somewhat where it's narrower than the wide gate. If you think about it, I'm going to use an example here. They're not ready for me to walk this far. Um, Okay, do you know what this is? This is a tool, right? To narrow, in the to use the word narrow in the Bible that we're looking at, it's not just that it's narrow like this, but it's difficult, it's constricting, it is continually tightening up, right? That's what it means. It's, It's not just that it's narrower, it's that it's continually constricting. It's difficult to get through, right? So if we're thinking it'll be easy to get through as long as we just live a good life, that's not what it's meaning. It's meaning that it's constricting you to get through. It's going to cost us. We're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to work to go through this narrow gate. It's not just about our beliefs, but it's about the way we live our lives. With the narrow gate... It takes our energy and our exertion of our spiritual living to stay on the course and to make it through. That's why Jesus doesn't say, choose the narrow gate. What does he say? Strive to enter the narrow gate. Strive, work, labor, right? Labor to enter into that. Because that is the process that we face in terms of living a faithful life and being the kind of people that can enter into the kingdom of God. Back in uh, the early 2000s, there was a movie called Remember the Titans. I don't know if you have seen that movie, but it was a very popular movie at the time, and it was about a high school football team in Virginia during a time where the schools were being integrated. And the team itself was divided racially between white and black, 
During the summer training phase, they went up to Pennsylvania and were at a camp training. And the coaches could see the divide. The coaches were even divided at this point. And their head coach, Coach Boone, forced them to get up early in the morning and run. And they were running and they were running and they were running. And you could see their white t-shirts were just dirty from falling down along the way. And they were pouring down with sweat. And they finally came out of the woods after this terrible run into a graveyard. And what they find out is, is that they have run into the Gettysburg National Cemetery. And the coach tells them to listen to the dead. Listen to the dead because they will remind you of what it means, what it costs to be divided what it costs to be divided. And they can either choose to be like the 50,000 young men that died on this field, or they can choose to come together, choose to work together as a team. It's going to be a lot easier. This is not what the film says, but we know this. It's going to be a lot easier to just be like they always were, right? To not be challenged, to just live the same way. But if they can do the hard thing, if they can work together, they can overcome a lot of that history. They can build a team, but it's going to take every ounce of energy. It's going to be hard work. And I think maybe that's why the coach made them run all that way. So they're, they're emotionally and spiritually beat down a little bit and ready to listen. Not everybody listens in the movie, but some do. The narrow road is often a challenging road. And to get there, it takes us striving, working hard to do it. But if, if you're on that cycle of waking up and getting on that easy road, I, you know how difficult it is to live with intention. So I've, I've talked with a few people before who have said that one of the things that helps them is to create habits in their lives to remind them to live with that narrow, difficult road in mind. One person that I talked to said, every time that they shake someone's hand, they remind themselves that they are a child of God and they are called to love their neighbor. What would it be like if every time you shook someone's hand, you're reminding yourself you're supposed to live in such a way that they, the person whose hand you're shaking, that you are there to love them and to be a light shining for them. How would that change? Somebody is going to be ruined because after you leave today, you're going to be shaking hands. You're going to say, I wish Pastor Mike had not told us this because you're going to be thinking about it. Some people say that every time they get in their car, when they stop at their final destination, they put their car in park. That's the cue, the habit for them to pray. So they pray before they enter into the next phase. Another person I've heard says that when they wake up in the morning before their feet hit the bed, or fit the, hit the ground, they pray, God, use me today. Help me to live for you. So that habit of reframing your mind every day to be focused on living on that narrow road, that difficult road, is one of the things that takes a lot of energy and intention. But simple habits like that can help us stay with that in our mindset. I want you to think about what you might do to go on a walk. Just a simple walk, an easy walk. Some of us might put on some, you know, regular running shoes. Some of us might even just wear flip-flops or something easy like that. But if you're going to go on a hike, a demanding hike, are you going to wear flip-flops on that hike? No. You're going to get your feet ready for that journey. You're going to prepare by wearing the right kind of shoes. So if we're thinking about being on the difficult road, isn't that, doesn't that make sense that we wake up in the morning, we're actually arming our feet for the journey of that difficult road. We are, we are getting ourselves emotionally and spiritually centered for living the right way. Jesus teaches us that choosing these, these destinations is not just about one decision, one time. And it's not simply about just getting there. It's about how we get there. It's about the way we get there. And it's the fruit of our lives that demonstrate we're on the right road. 
And I think if you look at what Jesus says later on in our scripture reading for today, that makes even more sense because he talks about false prophets, right? And those false prophets are people that proclaim something that isn't true, but they're very convincing. These false prophets might say something like, you know, it is such a good thing to be a Christian. It's so easy. Your life is so much better when you give yourself to Jesus. There's nothing, nothing hard after that. That might be a false prophet because Jesus is clearly saying that we are supposed to strive for the kingdom of God and to become more and more like him. A false prophet might be somebody who says that your financial blessings in this world is a mirror of your heavenly blessings, right? And so how much you have now is a sign of how much God loves you and blesses you. Some people have gone into financial ruin because they think that they're supposed to live this way, thinking that God will bless them. I've even seen a pastor on television say that they were able to pay for a private jet for their church in cash. (laughs) They said it like that, in cash. Humble brag, right? And that's not really what Jesus is calling us to do, to be flashy, right? Right? Jesus is calling us to serve and love and tell the truth. Other pastors that are false prophet might, prophets might tell you that it's okay to hate these people, even though Jesus says we're supposed to love others as our neighbors. In fact, there's one author that says if your God hates all the same people you do, you've probably made God in your image. So you see, the pathway to the narrow gate is not just about choice, but it's about dedication and striving each and every day, lacing up our boots for the journey and focusing our lives on embodying the way of Jesus. Because embodying the way of Jesus leads us to the narrow gate. That's the path. And we're all called to walk it. Whatever habits, whatever practices that help you do that, I think it's worth trying out. I think it's worth trying out. And I think that what you'll find is even though those steps are challenging, striving for the narrow gate is challenging. It is worth it every time. How many of us have lived according to Jesus and have found joy and peace and stillness in God at the end of that road. It's worth it. We can go with the flow and just float down the river, or we can strive for the difficult path. Either way, God is going to continue pushing us towards that more challenging path. God is going to continue to invite us to go and to turn in that way because God wants the best for us. God is not out there waiting to see what choice we make. God is actively trying to move us in that right direction. So don't think that you're in the boat paddling by yourself because you're not. God is in the boat with us. We can either paddle with God or we can be like those men and just kind of (laughs) dip the paddle in the water every now and then. But either way, we are making the choice. God is with us and behind us and wanting us to go in the right direction. And God wants us to make that choice now and 10 years from now and 20 years from now and will be with us every step of the way. All we have to do is strive each day. Make it a habit. Make it a choice to live, to act, to believe, and to serve. Would you pray with me? Holy and living God, we ask that you would be with us today and inspire us by your Holy Spirit to stay on the right path and to do all that we can to work with you to be in your spirit and to be led by your spirit, not to work against you. Help us to live in such a way that reflects your love and your grace and your truth in this world. 
Help us to choose. Help us to live. Help us to strive daily for your way in our lives and for the world. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.